So we're going to take a look at uh, lab number six, code conversion. Um, we're going to be using two uh, ICs, uh, two main ICs in this lab. We're going to use the 7447 BCD to seven segment IC. So we're going to be using a seven segment display. And the other major one is the decimal to BCD priority encoder. Um, and uh, this is going to be our seven segment display. Uh, we're going to use one 4.7K ohm SIP resistor and one 4.7K ohm resistor. Okay, this is the first time you've used the 4.7K ohm resistor. Uh, its color bands are going to be uh, yellow, violet, red, and that's 4.7K ohm resistor. I have the seven segment display that we're going to be using. Um, it's a common anode. That means the anode is the positive side. Uh, it has two common anode pins. You only need to hook up one of them, so I'll mention that again when I show you the wiring. Uh, also on these particular seven segment displays, um, you can see there's pin one, pin two, pin three. Pin 4 is missing, pin 5 is missing, and then pin 6 and pin 7. You do have to count the missing pins. So this is the schematic I've given you for the circuit. Uh, here's the 74LS147. And uh, I have two dip switches here. We're going to use the first eight switches and then just one of the switches off the second dip switch. Uh, I've got it shown here. This is a 10-pin uh, SIP resistor, so I'm just using the last resistor in the package. But I'm going to show you how to do that with a single resistor. I want you to notice that we're using the LEDs to detect a logic 1. So plus 5 comes in through the resistor, through the LED, to our IC. So the IC, right? is providing the logic zero to turn on the LED. Also when you look at the diagram you can see all these little bubbles on the inputs and all these little bubbles on the outputs. So whenever you see a bubble, right, you have to say that is active low. Okay, so for instance the A output when it's active it's going to be logic zero logic zero in this case will turn on our LED for us so it's active same thing with the inputs all the inputs are active when it's logic zero so in this case all the switches need to be going to ground for it to be active now this is extremely important you'll notice I didn't have room to write down please put the pin numbers okay but please put the pin numbers down here and note that these numbers here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, those are the inputs. They're not the pin numbers. So these are the pinouts for the 74147. You can see the A is on pin 9, and please note that there is a bar over the A. So that's A naught. That's why there's a bubble on there. Okay, there's B, right? That's B naught, C naught and D naught. And those numbers that we saw, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, those are the inputs. They're not the pin numbers. So input number 1 is on pin 11. This is extremely important. So on the schematic where it says to put in the pin numbers, we know that VCC is going to be on pin 16, right? This is a 16-pin IC. That means ground's going to be on pin 8. Up until this point, we've always used 14-pin ICs. This is a 16-pin. Input 1 is on pin 11, and input 9 is on pin 10. And our outputs, A is on pin 9, B is on pin 7, C is on pin 6, and D is on pin 14. You'll notice on the pinouts, pin 15 doesn't have a label. 
So it's an unused pin. So nothing goes to pin 15. Chapter 7 of your textbook talks about code conversion. And the example that they give you in your textbook is they're going to use a keypad. It's going to be encoded. Go to your central processor unit. Be decoded and come out on your decimal display or your seven segment display. In your textbook they give you the encoder. So these would be the inputs from your dip switch. And what they're doing is they're running the outputs through inverters to turn on LEDs. So what I'm doing is I'm eliminating the inverters and wiring up the LEDs to detect a logic zero. So this is the truth table that they've provided you with and you'll notice they use H and L instead of 1 and 0 and the X means they don't care. It can be a 1 or a 0. To explain this a little further, on the bottom line here, okay, the first switch is low on our output we're going to have all highs except for A that's going to be low. So that represents the number 1. The next line, the second switch is low. And on our output, the answer is low high. Right? So that represents the number 2. Notice that the first switch, it doesn't matter whether you leave it low or high because the second switch takes priority over the first switch. So as they move along here, now the third switch is low, and you can see the output is low, low, which represents the number three, followed by four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So if you reverse these, instead of it being low, high, high, low, if we saw it as 1, 0, 0, 1, we'd recognize that as the number 9. In the last case, if all the switches are high, the output is high, and none of our LEDs should come on. So you can see it goes by a priority. So if the last switch is on, it doesn't matter what all the other switches are doing. All that matters is switch number 9 is on, the output's going to be a 9. This is figure 7-4, the logic diagram of the 74147. Um, it's the decimal to BCD priority encoder. There's a lot of uh, different gates in here. Right, because what they're doing is they're decoding for each of the outputs. So just looking at the last gate, right? The last gate operates D, so it's the easiest one to do, right? It's only got two inputs going to it. The input is switch 8 or switch 9. So if switch 8 is low or switch 9 is low, so what number does that represent? Switch 8 is 1, 0, 0, 0, and switch 9 represents 1, 0, 0, 1. Now remember we're reversing it when it comes in here, right? So what we're saying is, if it is 8 or 9, if it's 8 or 9, the leading one is being represented. So D comes on. Now remember it's active low, so the output's going to be 0. I just wanted to give you a little close-up of my dip switches. As you can see, I've put them together. The SIP resistor package goes just behind my first dip switch. And I want you to notice there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight black wires going to my dip switch because I intend to use all eight switches. Now I need a ninth switch. So what I've done is I've hooked up the black wire to one side of one dip switch, just one single switch, 
and the other side goes through a single resistor to plus 5. And that single resistor is a 4.7k ohm resistor. To take an output from the switch, a wire is placed right there. That was my output wire. I just wanted to show you on the back side, I do have room to place my wire. I can place it here, here, or right close next to the resistor. Doesn't matter. Any one of those three holes can be used for my wire, which is the output from the switch and the input to my circuit. So this is my circuit wired up. I'm not going to go through it and wire it up wire by wire with you. Uh, you'll notice I've moved my power on LED to this end of the trainer. Uh, I kind of ran out of room at the other end. I have my uh, ground bus hooked up from one side to the other. Here's the first dip switch and here's the second dip switch. Here's my SIP resistor and I'm using a 10 pin SIP resistor which means I have one extra pin on it. So the first pin goes to the plus 5. The second pin is not used. So the third pin on my SIP resistor goes to my first switch and my first switch goes to ground. Now down here on the second dip switch, instead of using a SIP resistor in here, I've used a single 4.7K ohm resistor. So I just have that going from the power bus to the first line on my dip switch and the first switch on the dip switch going to ground. So on the truth table you can see they've set it up so that this is switch 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and the LEDs or the outputs are set up so this is A, B, C, D so it makes sense to wire up your circuit the same way that they've wired up the truth table. I have wired up this LED as being LED A, this is B, C, lastly D. My switches are wired up so that this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and this is switch 9. I've used yellow wires to represent my inputs, and I've used the blue wires to represent my outputs. All my LEDs are connected to power through 330 ohm resistors. And I've hooked up power and ground to my IC. You can't see it here, but I don't have anything hooked up to pin 15. So it's just left blank. All my switches are up which is logic 1. My outputs are not on. So when I move the first switch down, that's input 1. And you can see input 1 shows up on my LED. When I press the second switch down, my LED is representing the number 2. Notice it does not matter if the first switch is up or down. That's why there's an X on the truth table. It doesn't matter whether it's up or down. All that matters is the second switch. So the priority is given to the second switch. When I put the third switch to ground, I get the number 3 on the output followed by 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So it doesn't matter where all these other switches are put at, right? Once I go to 9, the other switches don't matter. So I can go down in reverse order. 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and 0. 
So now we need to fill in the truth table and we're going to use L and H just like they used in the textbook. So on the first line of the uh, textbook uh, we can see all the switches are high. So this is the case where all the switches are high and all the outputs are off. Okay, so the output being off is logic high. Right, because these LEDs are detecting logic zero and there are no logic zeros. So all the outputs are high. So on your truth table, all the outputs are high. Now it's easier to fill in the truth table starting with the last line. That's where switch number one is down. Okay, so switch number one goes to ground. That means it's active. So switch one is active. We're giving it the low, making it active. The output on our LED, now this is LED A, is on, indicating that there is a low there. So on our truth table, A was active, so active is low. The other LEDs were not on, so they were inactive or high. Moving switch 2 to the down position makes input 2 active. Doesn't matter where switch 1 is, whether it's low or high. Switch 2 is low, making it active. So that means this one is not active, this one is active, that one's not active, this one's not active. And remember, they're active low. So this one is low. So coming back to our truth table, A was not active, B was active, C was not active, and D was not. So on the second to last line of our truth table, uh, we have all our switches down, and now we're going to go to the ninth input. So when we make the ninth input active, you'll notice the output on D is active, and the output on A is active. Right, so these are both active low. So this is low, high, high, low. So on my last entry here, I have low, high, high, low. Once you've wired up the circuit for part A and verified that it is working, demonstrate it to your instructor so that they can initial it to indicate that it is complete. Now for the second part of the lab, uh, they've got a nice section in your textbook on decoding BCD to seven segment code. And they've given you an example of what all the uh, LEDs are in the uh, seven segment display. And they've uh, labeled them as segment A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Ours also has a decimal point at the bottom, and ours, I think ours has two decimal points, one on either side. And for the inputs, you can see that zero generates a zero, all the way up to nine. But because we're using binary code, there's actually 15 different combinations that can go in. And you notice once you get past nine, you end up with these funny little symbols. Now your textbook is trying to tell you that each individual segment is an individual LED. So we have the anode, we have the cathode, and the anode has to have the positive voltage coming in. We need a current limiting resistor and a switch to turn it on and off. 
So it's just like a regular LED that we normally use, except now they're saying that it's going into a package. And so instead of being a round LED, they're going to be a little bar LED. So it's just put in a different package. You can see that we're going to use one common input for the positive voltage. And each of the outputs, which are the cathodes of the LED, need to get a logic zero to turn on each of these segments. So you'll notice in your textbook they've now redrawn each of those LEDs as being a little bar. We now have plus 5 coming in through the common anode. We have current limiting resistors for each individual LED segment. It's very, very important to limit the amount of current going through each LED segment because they do not operate on 5 volts. We've seen in previous labs they're somewhere around 1.7 volts. So if you exceed that you'll burn out your individual LED segments and I've seen that done many many times. Now in this lab rather than hooking up individual resistors I just use a single resistor coming in on the common anode. It saves a lot of wiring and a lot of resistors touching each other. But they've used individual resistors for each segment so that each segment remains the same brightness. If you use one resistor on the common anode, if you light up one segment, you'll get one brightness. If you light up all the segments at the same time, it'll be brighter because now more current can flow because there's less resistance in the segments. All the segments are in parallel. And as you've studied in circuit analysis, if something's in parallel, the resistance is decreased. If the resistance decreases, the current increases. When current increases through an LED, it becomes brighter. So as you go through the numbers, 0 through 9, the more segments that come on, the brighter the number will be. So this is the 7447. Um, you can see that your BCD number coming in here are active high. There's no bubble there. The outputs for the individual segments all have little bubbles on the output. So they're providing a logic zero when they're active. So when A segment is active, it's going to provide the logic zero that will turn on your LED. Notice we've got three other inputs here. We've got the lamp test and it's got a bubble on it. So if you run the lamp test to ground, all the segments on your display will come on. We've also got blanking inputs. One's a blanking input, ripple blanking output, and a ripple blanking input. Sometimes you don't want the display to be active, so you can use these to stop the display from displaying a number. So if your input number is greater than 9, you might not want to display these funny symbols. So you might want to blank the output so that they do not display these. So in your textbook we have an example of wiring a decoder in a seven segment display. Uh, you can see that you have your inputs A, B, C, and D, which are active high. And we have our outputs A through G, which are all active low. We have plus 5 coming in through the common anode, going to an individual segment, and from that segment through the resistor to our active low output on the decoder. So on lab 6, uh, part B, we're going to go from BCD to 7 segment decoding. So we've got our first circuit that we wired up. And this is our decoder for our 7 segment display. You'll notice that I used a single resistor on the common anode just to make life easier because if I hook up all these individual outputs 
through resistors, the legs are going to start touching each other. So it's a lot easier just to run wires and use a single resistor. So that's what I've done. You'll notice on the lamp test, the ripple blanking inputs and the uh, ripple blanking outputs. I've run those directly to plus 5 volts. You'll notice that the output of the 74147 are active low, whereas the inputs for the 7447 are active high. So to accommodate this, I've had to run them through inverters. So the active low gets inverted and becomes an active high. Also notice on here I have not put any pin numbers down. So once again you need to fill in the correct pin numbers. Do not use the labels as pin numbers. So this is the first time you've used the 7447 so I've put the pinouts on the front page of the uh, lab number 6 and you can see once again it's a 16 pin IC so you do have to wire up your power and ground you can see there's your uh, lamp test and your uh, blanking inputs and blanking outputs. Uh, you'll notice that the inputs are labeled with capital letters. So A, B, C, and D are the inputs. And the small a, B, C, D are for the outputs. And they have a bar over them to indicate that they are active low. Now this is your uh, seven segment display. And what I wanted to show you here was the decimal points are at the bottom. So if you're going to orient this so you could read it, this is the orientation. The decimal points go at the bottom of the display. But this is pin 1, this is pin 2, this is pin 3, and you'll notice there is nothing here for pin 4 or 5, and this is pin 6, and this is pin 7. So remember to count the missing pins. On the other side of the IC, there is also a missing pin. This would be pin number 8, followed by 9, 10, 11. 12 is missing. And there's 13 and there's 14. Now I've wired up my circuit. And what I want you to notice is I had to run a power wire a red wire from the positive bus on the top of my board to the bottom of my board so that I could hook up the lamp test, the ripple blanking inputs and the blanking outputs to plus five. I didn't want to run these wires across my chip. So if I'm going to use the bus on the bottom of the board I have to bring power from the top of the board to the bottom of the board. This resistor up here is my single resistor going to the common anode of the seven segment display. Now the common anode is on pin 14 and pin 3. You'll notice I don't hook up pin 3 to anything. All I'm hooking up is pin 14 through the resistor to plus 5. Now one thing that you can do to check to see if your seven segment display is working properly is pin three goes to lamp test. So right now I've got it going into plus five. If I was to take that wire out and replace it with a ground wire Notice that all the segments of my seven segment display light up with the exception of the two decimal points. If it ends up being some kind of funny symbol you know you haven't got these wires going into the right holes. So the lamp test is very useful. Now I've just poked some wires into A, B, C, and D. So if I want to try it out and see what a number looks like Let's try the number 6. So for the number 6, A would have to go to ground. And notice we're getting a funny symbol here. B 
would go to logic 1, C would go to logic 1, and D would go to logic 0. So you can see we have the number 6 displayed. 0, 1, 1, 0 gets changed into the number 6. So you can manually check and see if you've wired up this side of the circuit. Since I know that the first part of my circuit is operating, I'm going to pull out these LEDs, replace it with an inverter, and hook my two circuits together. So looking at the schematic for part B, uh, where we go from BCD to 7 segment decoding, I've got the 74147 wired up with my LEDs, so I've got this part of the circuit working correctly. And I just gave you a little demonstration of the 7447 driving the 7 segment display, so I know this part of my circuit works correctly. Now I need to hook the two circuits together. And because the outputs of the 74147 are active low, meaning 0 is the active number, and the inputs of the 7447 are active high, meaning they need a 1 to be active, I'm inverting the logic using inverters. So I'm going to be using four inverters. They're hex inverters, meaning there's six on one IC. So I put the pin numbers down, uh, input on one, output on two, three, four, five, six. And on the last inverter, that's the other side of the IC, we can see that the output is going to be on eight, so the input is on nine. So it's important to put these pin numbers down so you don't get confused. I've also labeled the A, B, C, D outputs on the 147. They're 9, 7, 6, and 14. And the inputs on the 7447, the A, B, C, D, is 7, 1, 2, and 6. So over here on my circuit, I'm now going to take out the uh, four LEDs because I know the first part of my circuit operates correctly. I'm going to leave the blue wires standing up because those are the four wires that I'm going to need to go into the inverter. So I'm going to place my inverter right here where the LEDs were. So I have my inverter IC in here, the 7404. I've hooked up power and ground to the IC. And now referring back to my schematic, I can see that pin 9, so pin 1, pin 2, pin 3, pin 4, pin 5, pin 6, pin 7, pin 8, pin 9. Pin 9 is the A output, and it's going to go to pin 1 of my inverter. B is pin 7, and pin 7 is going to go to pin 3 on my inverter. C is pin 6, and pin 6 is going to go to pin 5 of my inverter. And then lastly, D is pin 14, so it's going to go to pin 9 of the inverter, so pin 9 is down here. So now I'm going to hook up the output of those inverters to the 7447. So pin number 2 of the inverter goes to pin number 7. So pin number 2 goes to pin number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Pin number 4 goes to pin number 1. So 1, 2, 3, 4 goes to pin number 1.
pin six goes to pin two. Pin six goes to pin two. And then pin eight goes to pin six. So pin eight goes to pin six. So this is my completed circuit. And as you can see, I've kept the wires fairly neat on either end of my circuit. So that when I hook the two together, I didn't have to try and push wires aside to try and hook up my circuit. This really helps a lot. So as you can see with all the switches in the up position, my output is zero. So if I push down on the first switch, I get a one. The second switch, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So looking at your truth table, it wants the output in hex. Remember, hex is zero through F, and decimal is zero through nine. So the two numbering systems overlap each other. So it didn't really matter if I said output in hex or output in decimal. For our project, the numbers are just going to be between the numbers 0 and 9. So in the first case where switch number 1 was low, we had a 1 on the output. And then we had a 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And when all the switches were high, we had an output of zero. Once you've wired up the circuit for part B and verified it is working, demonstrate it to your instructor so that they can initial it to indicate that it is complete. So I've drawn the schematic in multi-sim for lab number six, part B. And I just want to go over some of these uh, components that I've used here. The first one is the SIP resistor. To get that, you go to Place, Component. The group is Basic. And you want to go to RPAC. And this is a 10-line bust resistor package. So say OK. And when you place it on your schematic, close, you can see that we need to rotate it. So just right click on it and rotate it either 90 degrees clockwise or counterclockwise. Now because we want the first pin to be at the top, we would rotate it counterclockwise. Notice it comes up as a 1K ohm resistor package. So if you double click on it and go to value, you can change the resistance to 4.7K. And say OK. You can see I also have a dip switch in here that actually looks like a dip switch. To get that, you go to Place, Component, you want to go into Basic, Switches, and it's a DS, Dip Switch, Package 8. So here's what it looks like. So we can say OK. And you'll also need to rotate that 90 degrees. So I rotate it 90 degrees, and because I want the little dot to be on the other side, I can right click on it and I can flip horizontally. So now the little dot will be closed or 
goes to ground in this case. Delete that. The next component I want to show you is the seven segment display. So to place that we go to place component. In the group we need to go to indicators and you notice the indicator looks like a little seven segment display. In here we're going to be looking for a hex display. Then we want to go down to seven segment common anode. And if you click on it, you can see it comes up and looks like mine. So we'll say OK. And you can place that in your circuit. Close. So that's the one I used in my circuit. Now you'll notice on the schematic there are no pin numbers. So to get your pin numbers, you can go to Options, Sheet Properties, and where it says Package Pin Names, make sure that there is a check mark in there, and then say OK. Now it puts all the pin numbers down for you, except for the seven segment display. Because the seven segment display wasn't a specific part number, there are no pin numbers for it. You'll notice the seven segment display does not have pin numbers, so you're going to have to place a text box on your schematic and write in the pin numbers individually. To do that, you go to Place and Text, and then where you want to place your text box, you just do a mouse click, and it brings the box up for you, and then you can just type whatever you need to type in there followed by an enter to get to the next line and when you're done click elsewhere on your schematic so I don't need that now I want to show you the simulate uh, we can simulate this uh, seven segment display um, if I go to simulate and you'll notice the display is completely blank and when I click on any of these uh, switches nothing happens. So turn your simulation off. And what we need to do is go to our seven segment display, double click on it, and go to value and where it says on current, I-O-N, change the 5 milliamp to 1 milliamp and say OK. Now run your simulation and the display will come on. It's because we're using a 330 ohm resistor we have to tell the display to expect less current. So then as you go through your dip switches it should operate exactly as you wired up your circuit. So the first switch gives us one followed by two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So now to copy this into your Word document, you have the option of dragging a rectangle around everything you want to copy, pressing the right click button, and go to copy. And in Word, press enter a couple of times to put some blank lines in. And then sometimes you can do a right click paste or you can press control V and it should bring in your whole circuit for you. There's one more item I would like to show you. Sometimes you have trouble capturing a circuit or perhaps you'd like to capture several parts of the screen. One way to do this is to go down here. This is Windows 10 so you can search Windows and what you're looking for is the snipping tool so that's S N okay 
and up here you can see that there is a snipping tool so if you click on it it brings up this little snipping tool so you can go to new the screen turns a totally different color and you can highlight the section that you would like to copy so if I just want to copy this section okay, you can now save this so you can save this as a picture file either a JPEG so you can go to file save as and it automatically brings up capture but you can save it anywhere that you would like to so you can go through your directories so I'm be, I've been saving mine on the E drive and in websites so I'll call this thing screen capture. On the last page of the lab there are 10 questions for you to answer and hand in. If you are looking for answers open your textbook. Page 1 of the lab shows some hints. In this case it's solve problems 7.1 through to 7.20.